in an operating room, whether your operation takes you an hour or three hours, there's a whole lot that happens before the patient gets in the room, between when they get in, you actually start your surgery, and then at the end for cleanup. And if you can scrunch that time, you can actually be able to do more procedures per day um, without actually affecting the time that it takes you to do an operation. So I'm going to define operating efficiency is the, is the time that the operating room is not available to do other stuff. Getting the patient into the room, setting up the room, intubating and positioning, performing the operation we're not going to worry about here. This is all the other stuff. So why? is efficiency so important to us. There's a number of things that efficiency does. And obviously, revenue is, is an obvious one. The more things we can do per unit time, the greater revenue that we can generate. But I also want to spend a few moments talking about quality and success, because efficiency actually can help to dictate those things as well. When we look at quality, you know, efficiency, if we define it as not doing things faster, but creating uh, a greater attention to detail, a systematic approach to mistake proofing. You know, if, if you're like me, when you come home, you got a spot where you put your keys every single time when you come home. And if there's something in that drawer where my keys go, that something moves and my keys go in that spot. And I don't lose my keys. I'm crazy enough about it that when I go on vacation or when I come to conferences like this, I bring this little leather satchel that, that snaps up into little sides and forms a little fake drawer for me and it sits in my hotel room and I do the exact same thing. We all do these in our lives. We create systematic ways that we don't make mistakes. And if you do the same thing in the room, you can actually improve the quality of care. Remember, when we go into an operating room to operate, that is just a few hours of our day. These people in the room who are there to help us out could work with 20 or 30 surgeons over the course of the week. And if they have to do things different every single time, the potential for mistakes is enormous. And we get frustrated with that, but it's not their fault. We're asking them to do things different every single time a new person walks into the room. So if we can create some efficiency, some standardization in the process, we can actually create more mistake proofing and reduce the potential for errors for our patients. From a revenue point of view, obviously, you know, the more we can do per unit time, the more revenue we can generate. But we also can create greater procedure credibility and branding. Let me talk about the, the revenue first. You know, what does adding one more case per day, just one day a week mean? You know, if your turnover times are taking you an hour, hour and 15 minutes between wheels out to wheels in, what if they could reduce that down to 15 minutes? You could do just, just one more case per day, just one day a week, and don't even get more cases. Go do something else with that time. Go to your office and see patients. Do something else. What does that mean to you in terms of revenue? Well, the average reimbursement for a da Vinci prostatectomy with or without node dissection, if you do a bladder neck reconstruction or some lice of adhesions, some other something, it averages out to about $2,100. It's $1,675 Medicare, private payer is a little bit higher, and your average ends up being about $2,100. If you can do just one more case per day, just one day a week, we're talking about a $100,000 difference in revenue. Efficiency is enormously important <laughs> to revenue. And if you're not efficient, you're killing yourselves. You're killing yourselves and you're not being rewarded for it. But what about procedure credibility and branding? This one is actually the more interesting one for me. You know, there are surgeons who perform operations faster, more efficiently than other surgeons. And their outcomes are the same as the other surgeons. The, the, post-operative uh, uh, problems, the people who come back to the emergency room, people who have problems who come back to the office, they're, they're the same. But for those surgeons who do those procedures more efficiently, they're thought of as a better <coughs> surgeon. They just are, by the nursing staff, by the folks in the hospital. The guy that does it in two hours is thought of as a better surgeon than the guy that does it in six hours, even if the outcomes are the same. And we do the exact same thing to hospitals. There are hospitals that we think are bad hospitals because our on-time starts are horrible, and we're always being delayed, and the staff is never, <coughs> never there when I need them. And being able to get in touch with somebody is a pain. They're not worse hospitals. They're just less efficient. The post-operative problems, the nursing care could be identical, but we think of those facilities as worse facilities just because they're less efficient. So by building efficiency, you can actually improve your procedure credibility and branding, which then creates a greater competitive advantage. That actually leads to the higher revenue and long-term security. So efficiency significantly influences success, both in terms of patient quality care, revenue, and, uh, and procedure credibility. So let's look at big picture for efficiency, and then we'll look at a practical tool for implementation. 
From a big picture point of view, there are two kinds of activities that happen in all operating rooms. There are external activities and there are internal activities. External activities are those things that can be done while the operating room is actively engaged in something else, some other surgical procedure. So a nurse charting something in the computer is an external activity. The, the whole operating room shouldn't come to a screeching halt every time somebody has to type something into the computer. Internal activities have to be done while the operating room is down. Mopping the floor is an internal activity. You have to do that while the patient's out of the room. That's not something you can do while the patient's in the room. The goal for efficiency is to convert things that are traditionally done as internal tasks and convert them to external tasks, and at the same time to create task overlap. So let's talk about internal to external first. You know, traditionally, operating rooms will set up a back table, drape a robot, then call for the patient. When the patient leaves, they will undrape the uh, robot and, and, and then break down the back table. If you do nothing else, but you walk out of here and go back to your operating rooms and do these four things, you will drop 15 to 20 minutes off your turnover times, guaranteed. If you set up the back table, drape your robot, clear the back table, and undrape the robot while your patient is in the room. This is totally safe. It is not against AORN standards. It's a very reasonable thing to do because there's a lot that has to happen from when the patient enters to when you actually need any of these things. And we'll talk about a model that makes this work. So task overlap. You know, most operating rooms work in series. And this is just the tradition, the, the history of operating rooms. You have four people that work together to do one thing, and then when they finish it, they go to do another thing, and then when they finish it, they go to do another thing. You know, this, my, my daughter is seven years old, and, and I'm the coach for her seven-year-old basketball team, which is an absolute riot. I mean, if you, if you do nothing else with a Saturday afternoon, go find a local elementary school and watch seven-year-old girls basketball, because it is absolutely hysterical. This is what happens. You have a bunch of girls that are out on the court. Somebody chucks a ball out there. All hell breaks loose. They all clump around the ball. There's really very little dribbling or passing for that matter. The ball ends up on the ground. There's this big scuffle. It's like rugby. Then the ball squirts free. One of the girls realizes it. She chases after it. The other girls rush after her. And this happens for an hour and a half while we sit in the stands yelling, dribble, dribble, dribble. This is an operating room. This is what happens in our operating Our operating rooms are seven-year-old girls' basketball teams. What happens? You have four people who get around a back table, and they're like scuffle, 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 trying to get things done. And then the ball springs free, and they decide that they finished that. So then those same four people go over, and they drape the robot. And then when that's done, two of them hang out, sitting sterile, doing nothing, while one person goes, to, goes on break, and the other person goes to get the patient. It's horribly inefficient. It's series, doing things one after another. If instead of doing things in series, if we did them in parallel, if we said, you know what? Draping the back table takes about as long as, as, as draping a robot, which takes about as long as it takes to go get a patient. Let's each one person have a task and just do them at the same time. What happens is everybody finishes at about the same time. And you're only limited in terms of the number of things you can do by the number of people in your room. So if you have three people, fine, then you get three boxes. You have four people, you get four boxes. Do things in parallel. And if at the same time you can actually take things that are traditionally done in that red zone, traditionally done when the operating room is down, and add them as boxes on the stack, you will automatically reduce the turnover times. And by doing this, not because we have a lot of people, not because we have a lot of stuff, our time from wheels out to wheels in is typically anywhere from 7 to 15 minutes. 7 minutes if we have smoke coming off our heels, 15 minutes if we're kind of sit sitting back not doing a whole lot. It's about 10 minutes from wheels out to wheels in. And we have just three people. Nobody's working that fast. We just work in parallel. So let me talk about a practical tool to actually implement this in your operating when you go back because this is real and it is reproducible. And we have done this across the country for operating rooms from Kaiser Permanente, big union hospitals, to small little hospitals in Peoria, Illinois, to big, big university centers. It doesn't matter where you are. Pieces of this model work just fine. So let's look at this. I'm going to break it down and look, look one step at a time. But essentially what we have is we have each person's role in the operating room is color-coded. But I don't want you to view this vertically. I don't want you to look at each person's tasks. What we're going to look at is horizontally what's happening at the same time as other things. So on the left-hand side are these trigger points, and these are things that happen in any robotic room. It doesn't matter whether you're taking out a prostate or a uterus or you're doing a mitral valve. These are all things that happen in every robotic room. So the first trigger point is the back table is open. Now, I don't mean that the back table is set up. I mean it's a giant heaping pile of stuff. There's a Foley catheter teetering on the top about to slip off if somebody doesn't grab it. It's just a mound. At that point, your circulator should leave. 
she should leave the room and go get the patient. Why? Because it takes about seven minutes to actually leave the room, walk to pre-op holding, find the patient, check their arm bracelet, check the H&P, check the consensus sign, make sure that all the checks and balances are in place, and actually bring that patient back to the room. It takes about seven minutes for a single human being to set up a back table completely. Task overlap. They get into the room. What happens now? We're positioning the patient. Now, now is when you can drape the robot. Draping a robot takes like three minutes. I mean, five at most if you don't know what you're doing and somebody's going to walk you through it. It takes way more than five minutes to get a patient from the stretcher to the bed, get the EKG leads on, oxygenate them, induce them, intubate them. There's a whole lot of stuff that has to get done that takes way more than three minutes. There is plenty of time to drape a robot. The techs get all bent out of shape that they're not ready when the patient comes in. And the reality is they don't need to be because we don't need your stuff yet. There's still lots of time. So patients draped. What's important here? We got the surgeon making the incision. You've got the first assistant cleaning the scope. The circulator should be connecting the bovi and the gas in that order. You know, in an operating room, we ask for things a lot. Can I have, can I please, can you? We ask an average of two to three times a minute for something, which over the course of you know, a day doesn't seem like a whole lot, but if every time you ask for something, they have to react to you, and it takes them 10 to 15 seconds, that adds up to literally <coughs> hours at the end of your day of people just responding to your needs. And listen, if you're like me, you're not complicated. You do it the same way every single time. They shouldn't have to think about this. They should be able to anticipate it. So when you make your incision and your circulator is over on the side connecting the gas, and because the gas people who make the cord aren't the same people who make the same, the, the plugs, they're struggling to get it on in, and you make your incision and you hit uh, something roughly the size of the aorta, you grab your bovi and you hit it and no noise. So you go bovi and she goes, oh, sorry. And she drops the gas and runs over to the other side and plugs in the bovi. And then you hit your bovi, you cauterize, you put your varus needle in, you say gas. And she goes, oh, sorry, gas. And runs back over to the other side to put the gas in. Why did that happen? It happened because the gas happened to be on the side where she was standing, and she was doing it in the order that was most convenient, not in the order in which it was needed. In your operating rooms, make a concerted effort to look at the order in which you need things and guide your teams to do things in the order in which it's needed, not in the order in which it is most geographically proximal. Ports are placed. Robots being docked. One of the important things here that I would tell you, especially uh, for folks uh, in the private practice setting, do not let your team dock your robot for you. Be a part of the docking process. Listen, it is really easy to dock a robot. It is not hard at all, and the S and the SI models have made it even easier. And if you're completely dependent on your team to dock your robot, and your A team members aren't there, and your B team person is stuck in traffic, and your C team person's kid is sick and they're at home, and you've got a brand new person in the room who looks at you lovingly and says, Dr. Fagan, I'm so happy to be in the robotic room. I've never been in here before. And you just go, oh, good Lord, it's going to be a really, really long day. If you're depending on that person to dock, you're completely hosed. You need to know the robot better than your team does. Don't let them do it for you. Surgeons off the console. When you stand up from the console, you are telling the room that until there is a new patient on this bed with a new armband, I am not sitting down at that console again. Which means they should not just roll out your robot. They should roll it out. They should take the drapes off. The drapes should go into the garbage. They should tie up the garbage and stick it by the front door. They should take all the robotic instruments and stick it into a basin, get them ready to go. They should start cleaning up because you and your first assist are going to sit there at the bedside for the next 5 to 15 minutes to get the specimen out and close up the wounds. What is your team going to do during that time? They're going to stare at you. Have them do something useful. Get the room ready for turnover. Clean up all those things that you no longer need. Because if you do this, by the time your incisions are closed, there's nothing on the back table. The robot's undraped. All the garbage is put away. All that should be left is a couple of things on a mayo stand that you're using to close. And your turnover, there's just nothing to do. All they have to do is get the stuff out of the room, mop the floor, and open it back up. That's why the turnovers in our operating room are 7 to 15 minutes. There's just not that much to do during turnover. So why is it that everybody isn't doing this? Well, a number of things. Poor preparation. People are not going to act on these things unless you get them to be a part of a team. 
if they're not prepared to do this, if they're not expected to do this, if the OR management isn't involved in this, then this can't happen. Lack of teamwork, pit crew mentality. This is the, absolutely the most destructive. This is the, the whole, I'm the wheel guy, and I put the wheel on and I take the wheel off, and if the gas guy needs help, I'm sorry, that's the gas guy. If you've ever built a house, you've experienced this frustration when your plumber comes and there's literally a quarter an inch of a piece of wood that's in his way, and he won't take a freaking piece of sandpaper and sand it down to put his pipe in place. He's going to wait two weeks for your, for your guys to come on back and cut a little notch for him. That's a pit crew mentality. You need your operating room to have a crew mentality where people do have their designated jobs, but everybody's not only encouraged but expected to help each other out, even if it's not their job. That means that anybody with two hands and two feet should be able to pick up a mop and mop the floor if your folks who come to clean the room don't show up. The other problems that we see, lack of standardization. Different equipment, different stuff for every single surgeon who walks into the operating room. This is an absolute, absolute disaster. 30 people using two different robots in your hospital, and you expect them to get it right every single time you walk in? No way. There needs to be a robotic committee, and they need to figure out what those standard items are that everybody's going to use and make that a standard list with as few things as possible that are individual to the surgeons. Not a whole lot that we need in robotics that has to be individualized. It really is very standard. Improper storage, this is a huge problem. You know, when you ask for, you know, they put in an instrument and it's zeroed out. You go, I need a new, you know, Maryland bipolar. And the person disappears for what seems like 14 hours. And they come on back into the room. You're like, well, where'd you go? And like, well, I had to go down the hallway into the storage area, but it wasn't there, so I had to leave. I had to go down the elevator. I had to go over to the other storage area. I got my car. I went across the street. And you're like, good Lord. You want a just-in-case box. You want stuff to be stored as physically close to where you use it as possible. We're trying to minimize waste, and motion can be is just as wasteful as stuff. So create yourself a nice just-in-case box, organize it, keep it all in your room, one extra of everything is all you need, make your people walk as little as possible to get those things. Store them efficiently, standardize things, create a crew mentality, prepare properly. All these things are critical to efficiency. The common theme amongst all of this really is standardization. We want to standardize information, good communication at all critical points. Don't forget, you're sitting at a console with your head buried in there, and if you shout out to the world, I need a new Marilyn, nobody knows who you're talking to. If you're having an open or a laparoscopic case, you look at them, you make eye contact, you say, Sue, go get me a new Marilyn. When you're in a console, you're just buried in that vision system. Nobody knows who you're talking to. Call them by name. Make sure that they respond to you. Do like what the pilots do, do a little bit of read back. You know, I need a Maryland Bipolar. Randy, this is Susie going to get uh, your Maryland Bipolar. Be back in two minutes. Okay, thanks. Read back. Communicate. Standardize your tools. Only what's necessary and correct. Don't open all sorts of extra just-in-case stuff. Standardize the rules. And have a problem-solving cycle. You can't be the only one figuring out problems. Involve your team. Make it standard at the end of the day that it's not just like, man, that went horribly bad. You all need to gather up and say, why did it happen? And what can we do as a team to make sure that it doesn't happen again for whoever's in this room? And you got to standardize expectations. Expect success from your team. Expect excellence from them. If you don't expect it, you won't get it. As you look at all this stuff, it all seems very exciting. It all seems very interesting. It all seems very doable, and it is. I would caution you not to try to do all of these things. If you try to change the entire way your operating room works all at once, there will be a giant revolt, and this whole thing will go into the trash. You want to pick one thing. You want to say to yourself, what part of this process is causing me the most pain? What involves the least change the way things are currently done? What's going to have the greatest impact with the smallest amount of effort? Start there, and then step by step add in those things that are most relevant to you. If you can't do all these things, that's fine.